we'll talk about whether or not you ever want to go into the open or not because i know that's still a yep. still a thing you still want to do it 310 pound sebum <sighs> 305 305 right? <laughs> you, still, podcast, you still want to do it I'm absolutely going to get to 300 pounds and compete in the Open next year and beat Derek Lumsford. Welcome to the Truth Podcast. I'm your host, Hani Rambod, and I got none other than Mr. Seabum himself in the studio. It's been a while. It is. It has been a while. You need to bring that microphone up to your face. I don't think it will stay up there. It keeps falling. So we'll tighten it up. I don't know how to do that. Well, you got Calvin. Calvin, go in there and hook him up like a tow truck. There. That's better. Yeah. Why is that wrong? <laughs> this is the best the part of the whole podcast. <laughs> He's coming over. Oh, That's better. <laughs> there you go, Calvin. You got it. We good? Oh, right, that's better. We're good. Yes, much better. Back on the podcast. That's right. When was the last time I was on it? Last year or was it two years ago? At least a year. I think it was last year. Yeah, I think it was about a year. <clears throat> and now, have you been... At, in this one, in this studio? Yeah, you didn't have the little fancy sign behind you, though. Oh, the same, yeah, the truth. Is that cool? Very cool. The truth with Hawk Tua. Is that what it says? The Hawk Tua, yes. <laughs> yes, that's our current events. Yep. I don't even know how that came up the other day. Cam was talking about her. No, he wasn't. I'm joking. <laughs> it came, I don't know, Calvin brought it up or something, but Cam knew who she was, so. <laughs> and the way I said, no, he, he doesn't know who she is. And he goes, that girl's from the street. What did you say? She's for the streets. She's for the streets. Yeah. God, 11 years old. His lingo is way ahead of his own age. I think his lingo is like surpassed yours and Calvin's. For sure. I can like pick up on what it is, but like I haven't heard it before. He was giving you the aura vibes, right? Yeah. He was like he was saying, counting my aura. Yeah. I started at 5,000, then I got to 60 by the end of the night. So, so for those of you are listening night. and don't have children in preteen, teen, the aura points, from what I understand, is kind of like respect slash coolness factor. Coolness factor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so he said, Chris, you get 3,000 points because you're married now. You get a three, another 3,000 points because now you have Bradley. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, and you get 1,000 points because you won the Mr. Olympia, <laughs> the Olympia championship. And you, what did you say to him? Like, well, I, but I won five times. I said I got five, so it gives me more. He's like, yeah. And I'm like, how many do you have, Cam? He's like, I have 50,000. I'm like, how do you have 50,000? He's like, I have more experience than you. <laughs> I'm like, experience what? what? <laughs> and he's like, just more. I'm like, okay, fair in, enough. In NBA 2K. Yeah, <laughs> and guessing flags. And I mean, he's probably smarter than me, so he's got that. I don't know about that, but he's definitely one of those kids that like, like a dry, like most kids are a dry sponge, right? Yeah. They pick up so much random pieces of information. He's definitely smarter than most kids, though. So. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, don't, I only have one, so I don't know what to compare him to. Fair enough. <laughs> you know? But, um. But yeah, it's funny because he, like, when I heard that he knew who Octua was, and somebody said that she just turned on her uh, Instagram page today. So, the merch. is that Calvin? Was that you that said that? She turned on her Instagram page today. The Octua girl. Yeah, I mean, she's Sponsor just her for Evagen. For Evagen? Yeah. Well, for what? Like, what product? Make a Octua flavor pre workout. Ooh. Just write spit gross. on that thing at the end. Or maybe it's a test booster. Spit flavored. Maybe maybe we'll tag her the test booster to the Evo Boost. There you go. Do it. It'll Evo Boost, so, and then you'll get the Hawk too. The sad thing is, she'd be your number one athlete for like two months, and then she would turn to nothing. Do you think the only two months? Maybe three. Okay. But yeah, not long. You gotta capitalize quick. Yeah. So Ryan Reynolds' marketing strategy. Is that what he does? He just picks stuff that are like trending and popular, popping off on the internet, makes a funny video about it, super related, does a commercial related to it. And then he continues to do that and stuff that it's like only relevant for a week because he can make it like in a two days. And he turns around and he just makes money. Yeah. That's smart. Yeah. Very smart. He also has like a Hollywood team probably in his backyard to do it. So it makes it a little easier. Well, he seems to have, you know, got, got his shit together. A little bit. <laughs> he makes a lot of money, that guy. But I think that ultimately... What did, what did you say, Calvin? She turned on some, uh, what do you call it, right? Like, she turned on her Instagram, and then she uh, released merch. So what Calvin says, if you can't hear it because the mic won't probably pick it up, is the fact that she turned on her Instagram, turned on merch, got to already like 100,000 followers within hours, and then started selling T-shirts. So I'm sure that she's Smart got girl. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Somebody, someone's leading her in the right direction in terms of marketing. Yeah. And uh, and again, if anybody knows her, what's her real name? Haley Welch. Haley Welch. If anybody knows Haley Welch, 
Uh, I think she'd be a good guest for the podcast to see if she actually uh, made that up on the spot. You think she made that up on the spot, or do you think that she was like legit being just honest? I think she was being funny. I think she was just fucking around making a joke for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then, we'll never know. But now she'll know that everybody will know her as the yeah. Tour girl. Yeah. Yeah. Right, enough hawk to a girl. Yeah. Okay. What do you want to talk about? Yeah. So I want to talk about what's been going on, man. I mean, there's been a lot going on. You've traveled more than you ever have. And being able to go to Dubai, we haven't talked about that. You went to Turkey. You got the hair transplant. Obviously, hair it, my head now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, same amount of hair, just in different places, <laughs> technically. <laughs> well, you got that done. And, you know, just a lot of traveling around. Just got back, came over from Vegas recently for your for the GNC convention. But I guess my whole thing is that was it crazy? Like because I'm so used to doing it, but you're not. So how, travel you mean? Yes. The beginning, I mean, since Bradley was born, I haven't tra- I barely traveled. I've only done like two or three trips. Right. But before that, I think post Olympia from November 17th until May something, I traveled every single weekend. Sometimes two to three states in a week. And that was like crazy. Whatever, however many weeks that is in a row, it was nonstop. And it's definitely started to beat me up. Mentally, physically, I just felt like crap. And I hate it. And I, I always say I don't like traveling. And I'm an introvert. And I like to just be at home alone and do nothing. That made me just want to do it even more. So I definitely was not a fan of that at all. But it's really nice now having a baby to use an excuse for everything. It's, hey, you want to do this? Oh, I got to get home to get my baby. You want to come to this trip? Oh, I can't. You know, I got a baby. I can't do that. So, so you have nice. a more legit excuse. Exactly. Yeah. And people respect it a lot more. Remember, right. I was supposed to be somewhere, and I was like, oh, "I've got to get home to my wife and the baby." I'm like, oh, you're right, you're right. It's okay, it's okay, Chris. Don't worry about it. Like, <laughs> yeah, <"It's> nice, nice. <laughs> which is actually true. Cause I want to. I'd rather be there than anywhere else. But people at least respect that more than I'm lazy and I don't want to travel. Right. Well, but when you were traveling, I want to go backwards to to Dubai. Dubai is so epic, and it was your first time in Dubai. Second. What? Did, was it your second? I'm my second. Yeah. When was the first time? The year before. Yeah, but what happened with the year before? Was it just going? I didn't to go to the expo. We oh, just that's went what to it was. Distributor. That's yeah. right. That's why I thought that you didn't go. I forgot. You just went there for meetings and then you left. Yeah, I remember that now. And then, um, but this time you went to the expo. How did you feel the difference was? Because I personally feel a big difference mm-hmm. when I leave the states. Yeah, but you're so popular both inside the U.S. but also outside the U.S. Mm-hmm. Did you feel a difference at all? in terms of like the, when you go to Dubai and you go to India, or is it, do you feel like it's the same amount of, you know, fandom in terms of people coming and like recognizing you and I mean, like I felt like it was very different. I mean, for example, last night we're at Pickleball here in Texas and people were like standing back, kind of looking, being quiet, waited till we were done, asked for a picture of everyone, like, thank you so much, I appreciate it. It was super polite and like keeping their distance. And then when I was in Dubai, I wasn't even, I was going to like do a talk and I was just walking through and I walked in and people recognized me and they just started screaming like, see bomb. And then everyone saw it with me and they just swarmed <laughs> me. Right. And then security was like, we're not doing pictures. We got to get on stage. You got to do a talk. And people were like grabbing my shirt, reaching me, reaching over, trying to take selfies, like trying to throw stuff to sign and all this stuff. And I'm like getting worried because we're literally getting surrounded by all these people in Dubai. And then the security guard brings us under like a, a big drape into <laughs> mm-hmm. like the back, like private area i don't know this the exit private area where you're not allowed under the curtains we go back there and someone lifts up the curtains and sees me and they all just swarm underneath and this was in dubai in dubai there's security guards literally like holding hands like this and people are shoving them reaching at me like grabbing at my shirt like pushing people out of the way trying to get me out of the door and like i've never experienced that before like it's not like a celebrity like that and they got me to a door like an exit door that was locked and they were literally holding me against the door and it was locked so i was stuck there and someone had to come around the outside, open it, let me out, and then hold them all back and then close the door and lock it again. And I was just like, what the fuck just happened? And I was it was a little scary. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little a bit of an anxious person. And all these people swarming me in a different country. Some people don't speak the same language, just like yelling at you, grabbing you, touching you. And people are like, just stay back. Not in time for that. So it got intense for sure. You know, I didn't know. I remember you said it got intense, but it didn't sound like it was that intense. It was pretty intense. Yeah. yeah you for, you left that part out. <laughs> yeah. I was a little scared for a moment. Other People were very nice. You know, they're very excitable, obviously, and I was just, it wasn't the time for it. So afterwards, I did my talk. I met some people. They got a more formed line and everything was okay. But that moment right there kind of sketched me out a little bit. So that was like the biggest difference in experience that I, I've never had that ever happen in America. That's crazy. Cause I, again, I remember you said things got intense, but I did not know 
that you ended up getting that. It, it got that sideways. Yeah. Dom was there. He was like, bro, I was scared. I was ready to throw some fists at some people if they kept fucking touching you and grabbing at you. I was like, yeah, that was intense. Yeah. Didn't get violent, luckily, but it got a little weird for sure. Is that the most intense it's been? Or have you been to India yet? I did go to India, but I didn't do any like public things. Oh, because it would be crazier, I think, in India. I imagine it would probably be a lot, yeah. Yeah. When we were out places, a lot of people would see me and come and like get excited and everything, but it was never in like a public fitness expo like that, so yeah. it wasn't as bad. Yeah. When I went to uh, India a couple times, love the people, love their energy, but sometimes it can get a little bit crazy. So when that happens, it really becomes a matter of just like, hey, do you have the right security? You have an exit plan yeah. <laughs> because they just you need they security. Get, yeah. yeah, you do need security and because it's, it's just they're so excited because they see us on social media. And again, with you, you're a whole different level. But just when, when I, you know, and I've been there several times and you just have this crazy abundant amount of energy or they do in regards to like, I'm here, I'm seeing somebody that I follow every day. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden literally I can touch that person yeah. and they want to come over and touch you. They touch your feet. Mm -hmm. It's like, a, you know, a, a showing of respect. And so it just becomes crazy. But like you said, you felt a little of that in Dubai, but when in India it gets kind of you know, super crazy. So you have to really control it. Yeah, That's like, I call that like a rock moment. Like what like, like Dwayne Johnson has to go through when he goes into like All the time. Or yeah. Taylor Swift. Oh, I'm the sure. videos they have of Taylor Swift, they'll find her hotel and there'll be 10,000 people like just surrounding her whole entire hotel and they have to like call in the police everyone like whoever else is there and create like a huge path get her out of the back or something and then move her to a new hotel because she's literally like getting swarmed like thousands of people just because they find out where she's staying what they gotta do is they gotta get like a taylor swift like impersonator to look alike and then <laughs> like they, five of them and yeah scatter and then just them. scatter them through yeah. so many hotels and then her be on a different well, did you ever one? see how they brought her into her concert no they had like uh -huh. no those big metal like they're steel framed black that they bring instruments in and everything yeah. on the wheels. She was in one of those. They were just wheeling in instruments, bringing in all this gear and everything. And then someone had a video and through a crack of like a curtain, you can see her get out of one of them. And that's how they brought her into the concert. They like got her on a truck, unloaded her off and brought her in on that. Like a circus animal. Yeah, literally. It's crazy. I would never <laughs> want that. That sounds Dude. horrible. <laughs> no, it's not worth it. Someone recently, I think they said the best way to be rich is to be rich and anonymous. And that's definitely a fact for me rather that well, especially you absolute like fame like taylor swift no. yeah yeah especially you because you're i think that you've actually like sometimes in some ways have become a little bit more introvert or wanted to become a little bit more yeah more private recently <laughs> right for sure i think I, I mean i'm getting older i have a kid time is more limited now my energy is more limited now so who i give my energy to is very important to me so i really i care more about who i'm around and who i'm with and you know, if people are polite and nice to me, that's great. But I want to be able to just have my time and my energy for people I know and that I love, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I could totally sense that too in the last couple of years mm -hmm. that you've, especially since Bradley was born, but even before that, it was kind of going in that direction. But I think it, like you said, now it's kind of like more distinct Yeah. with that. And I think that since, um, you know, speaking of Bradley, How's things going? I mean, um, I know that you guys have been very open about sharing pictures or some people don't like to share pictures. You guys have been showing tons mm -hmm. of pictures of her. But also I know that Courtney is very open about also doing like Q&As on Instagram and, and being able to that. And I think sometimes it, that's a form of therapy to be able to kind of share and talk a little bit. But how is that going with the postpartum with that? You know? How's it's been it, going good. Uh -huh. it's, it's funny. We were talking about it the other day how people – Everyone kind of gives you different vibes who have children when you're about to have a kid. They're like, oh, like just get ready and all this stuff. And we're like, how dare they be so ungrateful about their child as they're saying, get ready for the chaos. And then you get into it and you're like, oh, shit, this is what they meant. Like, it's a lot. It's chaos. <laughs> yeah. And it's beautiful. It's amazing. But there's just so much chaos mixed in there. And, you know, obviously for Courtney, it's, you know, you deliver a baby hardest thing ever most physical challenging thing i feel like the body can ever do and then you have a hormone dump that's the greatest in any natural human history of anything is post-pregnancy and then you just have to take care of this child who doesn't sleep you're breastfeeding all these things are going on it's crazy so it's definitely there's been challenges of ups and downs for her and you know she's spoken about them herself but she's been an absolute rock star through it all like a champion through it. i expected it to be more chaotic in her like how she handled it but she's just like stepped into being a mom like perfectly like the baby's like crying and she'll like 
always be just patiently there for her, smiling with her, making her happy. She within weeks she knew what she needs. She's like this cry means this, this cry means that, this cry means that, and she's been handling it like a champ. So it's been really cool to see her step into just being such an amazing mother. And part of the reason I fell in love with her is as we were getting to know each other, I was like she would be such a good mom, and that was really important to me. To and one of the aspects I looked for in a woman was someone who would be a good mother. And seeing that now in real life, right in front of me, has been really awesome to watch and see her just step into that so easily. Not easily, been difficult, but gracefully, as gracefully as possible. So it's well, been good. She's such a nurturer, right? <clears throat> yeah. She's got a nurturing, and it. she's very empathetic. Um, you know, sympathetic, empathetic are very similar, but there's some people that have it and they don't, and some of the others that don't. Mm -hmm. And one thing, because I've known, obviously, Courtney longer than I've known you, and being a prior Miss Olympia, too, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Yeah. Because has there any been any Olympia champion that's married another Olympia champion? Because right now, I, I can't think of one. I'm not sure. Yeah. So I have no idea. No, I don't. Th I think it's the first time. So it's like Mr. and Miss Olympia, yeah. right? So I don't think that there's ever been a champion in one division, marry another champion, mm -hmm. right? So it wasn't like a Dorian Yates had married a, you know, Linda Murray or, you know, Linda Murray ended up marrying somebody like a, a Lee Haney, I guess those yeah. are more kind of era, you know, uh, specific. But it's, it's cool that you guys have that because she understands the industry mm -hmm. because of that. But do you think that since she, again, something else that I want to add is that, 95% of people that I know that want to go into like some kind of labor program and they say, oh, I'm going to have, you know, my birth plan is going to be, I am not going to take drugs. I am not going to do this. And it just it follows through, right? Yeah. It falls through. She literally, literally like followed it kind of like to a T, right? Yeah. That's crazy. And <laughs> it went like, a little like off, like whatever her control went more difficult than she imagined. Mm -hmm. And she stuck to everything she said she was going to do. That's what's crazy. And it was funny. I talked to a bunch of male doctors, a male anesthesiologist, a bunch of men who had like witnessed a lot more of that than me. And they were talking to me about it. I'm like, oh, yeah, she wants to do it all natural. She wants to do it like this, like blah, blah. blah. And they're like, why? And she's like, it's just something. It's her first baby. She doesn't really care about doing it or not. She, she might do it for future babies, but she said the first one, she wants to experience it. She wants the baby to be fully aware. She wants to be fully aware afterwards. And you know, her legs work and all this stuff like that. So she just wants to try it like that. And they're like, okay, good luck. They're like, she's going to hit X amount of centimeter dilation. She's going to be like, give me that, give me that epidural, that? epidural yeah. right now. Just put it in me. And I was like, maybe, I don't know. And they kept just putting that doubt in me. And I would like talk to her and I'd be like, I wanted her to be, have a realistic expectation walking in. I know how strong she is. And I was, so I would kind of ask at the beginning, like, are you sure? Like if it gets really hard, she's like, no, I know I'm going to do this. And I was like, all right. If you're going to do it, then you're going to do it. And then I, I kept telling the whole way along, she said, you can do it. I'm like, you're right, you can do it. I know you can do it. And she just had this unwavering belief in her the whole way. And then once she started going into labor, it was just like, I've never seen her like it. It was like like the videos of me before the Olympia where I'm just like locked in. She was just like locked in. Just like catching her breath, like doing breath work in it. Everything that she like planned and practiced, she did it throughout the whole thing. Like there was screaming, there was pain, it was absolutely crazy at one point i was falling asleep because we were up for like 48 hours i'm literally on the bed and she's like screaming and i can't keep my head up because i'm so tired and she's just locked in doing it and got through it exactly how she wanted and that was the most intense emotional thing i'd ever witnessed in my entire life it was birth it, there's nothing that you can ever explain i mean i didn't even go through it so i can't even understand what she went through but even witnessing it you can't explain and being there and then having like the ch life of your child in your hands and like uh, after like just screaming pain to just like her being like holy shit it's done she was almost in shock and then there's a baby in your hand literally a second later so it was crazy it was really cool to witness and it was amazing and it the bond it built between us and the love i have for her was just like immediately like so much more and it continues to grow even more now as a child so it was a really cool experience and i think i've always wanted to be a dad and i've always felt like being a parent, a father, or a mother is one of the most like rewarding things in life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some people don't want kids and maybe they don't, and they'll be happy with that. That's fine. But for me, that was very important for me. And I'm just super grateful that we have a healthy baby and an amazing mom to take care of her. So it's been a cool journey so far, but we're at the very beginning and a lot more unknowns to come. Well, and did she ever curse you out in the middle of the labor? Like never. in two days, she didn't be like, F you, Chris. You <laughs> she never did that. You hear about like that. stories like yeah, that. Yeah, she never yelled at anyone. She was just literally locked in. She would be going and she made us like pinch her too to like 
I guess, distract her from the pain. So I was like pinching her traps like as hard as I could. Uh-huh. And she would be like, pinch harder. And that was like the, the most she ever said to me. I was like, I can't. Like, I'm bruising you right now. She like couldn't feel it because she had so much pain going on down there. That's not. And then she would be like, like hyperventilating, like just shaking in pain. And I'd be like, babe, you have to breathe. Like catch your breath. Take one deep breath. Hold it and let it out slow. And she'd be like. <sighs> and she would just lock in every single time I told her to do that. And I was like, holy shit. Like, that's hard. Think of like in the middle of like a really hard set of squats. You're, you start to lose your breath. You're like, oh, yeah. panting. It's like to catch your breath then is hard, let alone when you're pushing a baby out of you for 24 hours. So like I said, it was inspiring to watch her go through. That's why like I think that. women have a tolerance, a pain, a natural pain tolerance because of that. They have to. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, there's, there's, I'm sure there's studies on it somewhere, but it, I just look it up. And I yeah, that famous it. line that if men had to give birth, there'd be no people on this planet. Absolutely. Very true. <laughs> like, like I could barely touch anything hot. I can't drink anything yeah, hot. No. And my wife leaks, like drinks liquid lava, right? Like, yeah. her if coffee. I found it like I, I was pregnant and I'd deliver a baby, the next day I'd be booking an epidural or a C-section or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and, and some people, like I said, we, you know, even when Farinez was pregnant and we were having Cam, we were going to go through this plan and then all of a sudden, you know, stuff went sideways mm-hmm. and the umbilical cord was wrapped around Cam. And they're like, we are not spending any more time baby has to come out now yeah. now like i'm like okay so the next hour i'll text everybody and they're like no the baby will be out in two minutes you need to just scrub up we're going yeah and i was like okay because they're like shit. heart rate's dropping his umbilical cords wrapped around him we got to get him out yeah and i was like oh shit like we thought we were just going to be there just to kind of mm-hmm. say okay like they might have to endure, induce she hit term and you're just like you go from like one extreme to another so for us it was a completely different emotional roller coaster but i think that it, it does, it creates a huge, huge bond, especially when you're there and you're just kind of watching it happen. But, you know, when you were there and all of that stuff was going on, what was the emotions you were going through? Was it more kind of like a relief or was it kind of like just happiness or was it just kind of, were you like scared at that point? What are the different emotions? Because I know, like I said, the build up for the two mm-hmm. days and then now all of a sudden you just have this, okay, the baby's out. Was yeah. it just like, what was that like? It was there was a roller coaster at first. It was just like shock, holy shit, here we go. Then it was excitement, and then I was just really tired. That's when I was like falling asleep, and then it was like she was going, she was going, and they were there was something that was going on where they like they were having a trouble finding the heartbeat, and they kept trying to find it, and they they felt like it was dropping, but they were losing it, and they had the heartbeat monitor on her, huh? and she hated being connected up to it, so all, she didn't want to get checked how dilated she was too many times because she was trying to do her plan and everything, and there were moments where I, like you just start to like you're expecting something that's so important to you, you start to like almost expect the worst. And then you have a bit of fear and you're like, fuck, if something happened like to her, to like this, to like, th- there's just so many th- complications that can happen. Sure. And then it got really close to the end and it was kind of a, some fear and then just trying to be there for her. And then when we were really close to the end, that's when my emotions started to come out. And I remember I was like, I, when she was in so much pain, I had tears in my eyes and I was literally looking away, like trying to wipe my tears. And I still don't know if it, what the tears were really for, just like emotional, whether it was just like, respect for her going through all this excitement to see the baby love for her and see also seeing in her in pain and feeling bad for how like hurt how hurtful she felt like how, how much pain she was feeling i like felt bad for her like I, and there was nothing i could do but just stand there and be like you got this baby <laughs> you know like keep going so there was a very emotional time there and i didn't want her to like see me crying and she wasn't too much pain to even notice but i kept trying to like look away and hide my tears and not let my tears come out until it was actually over and she was okay, the baby was okay, and all that stuff. So it was all throughout that, and then the baby came out, and I just started sobbing. I was just crying, and I was looking at her, and she was in shock because it went from all that pain to just like, I think she said she felt like nothing after. It was just all the pain's just done. She just, just literally was like this. like Adrenaline dump. Like, holy hell, like just so much adrenaline, so much pain, all that's just gone. And then she kind of like came to, and she's like seeing her baby. They put her in her arms, and they're like wiping her off, and... It was it was beautiful. It was crazy. That's I was awesome. crying, and it was just such an amazing moment. Yeah. Well, and all of that being said, you and I were talking about the fact that Derek, mm-hmm. when we found out Derek and, and Jelson were pregnant. Yeah. And you were like, "Well, that's kind of cool," <laughs> you know. And I was like, "Yeah, you know, one day I know you want to be a dad." Yeah. And you're like, "Well, I kind of you know wouldn't mind doing it sooner." <laughs> and <then laughs> literally asking you shall receive, and then next thing you know, three months later, you're calling me, and you're like, "You're like, dude." Don't tell anybody, but Courtney's pregnant. Literally, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so you guys are three months apart. You're both reigning Olympia champions. Mm -hmm. And you're both dads. And you're both literally like a year apart. I think he's like a year older than you. Yeah. uh, 30, 31. And um, 
And I feel that it's different because back in the day, people wouldn't have kids normally until after they were, you know, done Mm -hmm. with their careers. Um, Or maybe they had them quite a bit earlier, but you're literally having your first child all within your reign of being, you know, the Olympia champion. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that, how has that transformed how you look at competition now? Is it something that you feel like has, do you look at the competition differently? It came at an interesting time because in the past year I've been looking at competition differently and now it kind of just reaffirmed that. Like what I really, just what I'm really working for and what I really care about rather with started as just like championships, just winning, just wanting to be the best. And it kind of evolved more into a lot more of just like the personal growth that I get from it. The, the, the ability that my stories inspire others and help others and, you know, thinking of it was a tough year for me last year. It was a tough me- year for me this year. And there's so much going on. And in the future, being able to tell Bradley, like, if she's ever going through a hard time or doubting herself, if she wants to try something that she feels is scary or really hard, and she's got a lot going on in her life, for me to have something I can relate to that I went through that was like, when I was feeling the same as you back then, and I pushed myself through it with you there with my life. And, you know, I not only did that, but I also didn't want to sacrifice any of my relationships, which is a big thing for me was competing and having a child. I was really scared to not be like a present father. And, you know, it's different when she's an infant. There's only so much I can do with just me being there and holding her in the connection. It's not like much more than that. But I never wanted to pull away from Courtney or her or that or sacrifice my relationship at all for bodybuilding. You know, for some people, they're definition of success is just winning the olympia but for me if i win the olympia and i sacrifice my relationship i've lost so i don't care about that i want to be able to win maintain a good relationship maintain my mental health personal growth along the journey and have all that kind of encompassed in it so the way i look at it now last year i tore my lat and it was like four or five weeks where i was just like out of it like in a zone didn't want to film didn't want to talk to anyone just went to my gym by myself went home by myself and like just like kind of put myself like locked in like felt like shit, but I just got to get through this. And I told myself this year, I was like, I don't know if I'd be willing to do something like that again, because it is what's the sacrifice. What am I sacrificing? It's not just my own, like going in a shell for a while. It's being disconnected from Courtney and a baby at a time where they need me to be there. And I don't really want to do that ever again. So my view on things has definitely changed now. And I also think it was easier for me to do that then because I had no reason not to. So I'm like, whatever, I can just shut the world down and it'll be easier to handle this. But I probably could have gotten through that and been more connected in my relationship and everything if I'd really pushed myself to. So now I just see things as a lot bigger picture. It's not just the Olympia at the end of the tunnel. It's my family. It's my relationships. It's my own you know, mental health along the way that has to maintain a certain standard throughout the whole thing. And I'm not going to sacrifice everything just to win a trophy. Do you feel like you had to give up something? Because to me, it seems like life and time is like books on a bookshelf. And... For you to be able to have to bring in Bradley and bring in that connectivity to your family, certain things had to be replacing that. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like you had to possibly replace to be able to focus so hard on your family now while still trying to maintain a business, bodybuilding, all of the other things that you're trying to do? What do you feel like you had to sacrifice? I mean, from a physical standpoint, I'm in work in the office a lot less now. You know, if Courtney needs me to help her in the morning to get through stuff, I just stay until she's like settled or the baby's asleep and she doesn't need me anymore. So instead of me being somewhere by 9, 10 a.m., if I leave the house at 11, then I leave the house at 11 and I don't really care. And then I'm also leaving work at like 2 or 3 right now so I can go to the gym by 3 and then I can be home by 5 so that she has help for me throughout the night uh, after 5 p.m. So little things like that have been the more physical thing when that's kind of arranging my priorities you know, we have an amazing team in the warehouse now. We've kind of growing and growing. And there's a lot of phone calls, a lot of meetings, a lot of things that I don't have to do anymore. And I've just kind of removed myself from that. I have a block in the middle of the day I'm there. And then I focus on training and then being with my family more. So I really think it's made me a lot better at prioritizing my time mm-hmm. and being more organized and scheduling and all those kind of things. And just focusing on what actually is important, what you need to do and what you don't need to do and kind of cutting out the bullshit in between. So it's honestly been a good lesson. There's a lot of, you know, when you're young and you have a lot of free time and you you're at work for a while and then you, we would th- be there till five and then maybe some people are sitting downstairs and we'd sit there till 6.30 just chatting bullshit, just doing whatever. And right. some of that's cut out now, but that's totally okay because I get to go home and see my baby and, you know, it's a bit of a sacrifice, but it's also for an even more beautiful reward. So there's just things like that that I've kind of replaced and it's more so been probably cutting out of work more 
so I can focus on bodybuilding, which is so important to me and most importantly, my family first. What's up guys, Hani Rambod here, 24 time Olympia winning coach and wanna give you the opportunity to get two free weeks of my FST7 app. Check out the link below. Yeah, so basically efficiency. Yeah. Right, so yeah. I think that's another thing that a lot of us, when we get caught up in a lot of different things like businesses that we have and different things that we have to do, that is a big takeaway is really creating that efficiency because you don't really understand how much more efficiency you can create if you get even more organized. Mm -hmm. And I feel like what happens is you forget about that because it's not needed. You don't really focus so much on it. And I'm learning that as well because I have the Olympia coming up and we're, you know, about 16 weeks out. And I just knew that like I got to get all of my stuff done as much as like the product development or this or that. So that way, if I'm going to be able to focus on other things with the preps, mm -hmm. I can do that. But I think that when you try to spread yourself so thin and you're working all around the clock, you just work harder, not smarter. Yeah. And that's something that you can really kind of be able to tighten up quite a bit. But you just have to. It's like you have to want to lean into that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a, that's a thing that I've seen you be able to do because it's like, okay, you say yes or no. Like you said, don't sit there and shoot the shit for an extra hour after work if you don't have to because yeah. you have to get home and do these things because you want to be kind of be there and be present. And I think that as I've seen you grow, like, like I said, it's been such a huge change in the last couple of years, right? Yeah. That we weren't, it's like, it's like, oh, I just want to win the Olympia. Then I just want to win the Olympia and, and have some successful... You know, again, and you never say like successful companies. I think you just want to like work hard so that you can, you know, the brands that you're a part of and that are, you know, you're, you know, are really tied to and you have ownership in, you want to be able to do whatever you can. But at the same time, I think you do a good job trying to balance that all out with your personal life. And I feel like it's really not wasting your time around people. That's one thing I've learned around, uh, that I've learned from you a bit mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, and I have a lot of things that I've learned from you and Hadi and Derek. Just, you know, it's never one sided for me where I'm just like, hey, let me teach you about this and prep and this and that. I always pick up on things. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that I've really picked up about you is the fact that you really not only know how to be authentic, but you also really know how to keep your inner circle where you keep your, your energy, your emotional energy tied to those that deserve it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you you know, you don't yeah. sit there and try to waste your time with things that you may not be able to really kind of move the needle on or they don't just seem to kind of align with your philosophies for sure and try to get people to change just for the sake of changing. Yeah. But you'll challenge people because I've seen yeah. you do it, right? Of course. I love to challenge people. <laughs> you do. Put little ideas in people's minds and <laughs> stuff. But if they're not there and they're not there, I'm just like, all right, then I move on. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's cool that you do that, though, because... I've really picked up on it in regards to a lot of things. And like I said, you and I banter where people will go in there and be like, do they even get along? Yeah. And it's just because we go back and forth sometimes, but it's fun, right? Yeah, it's, for sure. it's, it's emotional banter, but it's, um, but at the same time, it does get serious sometimes where you're just going to go like, Hey, look, let me listen to somebody I respect, I care about. And maybe I can create a little bit of that self-awareness. And I feel that that's what I've helped, it, it's helped me with being able to, you know, take in some of the ideas, whether it's social media, whether you're like, hey, look, be more open, try to be able to be, you know, when you're doing some things like when you're doing, you know, do some more YouTube, be, be a little bit more sharing with the content and information and your philosophies. Because again, I would never do it. Mm -hmm. I would have never done it. I've been like, no, I'm taking this shit to my grave. You know, <laughs> no, no one's getting know. this. If Cameron even wants to know, it's been burnt. <laughs> <laughs> like whatever it was yeah. like it's just something that was like colonel sanders recipe somehow yeah but it's just it's just too valuable and making sure that people do things you know what you know in a healthier way and make it more positive mm -hmm. and if you have to give up information that 10 years ago 20 years ago you would have felt like look now this is kind of part of your secret but at the end just because they have a piece of that doesn't mean they can do what you do mm -hmm. so it's like you said and they're like you know, you're like, doesn't mean they're going to be able to do what you do. Absolutely not. No. Right. Even I heard someone talking about like how high performers achieve things and like really high performing people are like artists and there's no step-by-step -step program that you can follow to be the best. And even if you had a step-by-step -step program that you made and you gave it to yourself and you tried to get there by following the program rather than just finding yourself along the way, mm -hmm. you wouldn't achieve the same result. And like, there's so much stuff that you do that like, 
you can't be explained by science. It's just stuff that you've learned. And it's not like you've written it down and create calculations. It's just intuition that you've built over time where you know what to do in the moment. My intuition, what my body needs, what my mind needs, and knowing where I need to be, what I need to do, and all these things. And that's what makes someone really great because you're doing something that really can't be copied. So in my mind, I could give away every secret in the world. Someone could know everything I'm doing all the time. But I know they're not going to execute the same as me. And even if they do, it's not going to be the same because they're just trying to copy me rather than doing what's best for them. Right. There's a quote I heard. It's, competition breeds parody and mediocrity. And if you're trying to just compete against someone to beat someone and you're looking at them and trying to do what they do, you're only ever going to be as good as them or a little bit better. Right. But if you're just seeking greatness and trial and error and trying to be your best self in an intuitive way, it's limitless how good you can be. You know, you versus you is constantly getting better. You're trying to beat yourself, you get better. Then you're beating yourself again, you get better. And it's just back and forth better and better. And the limit, it's limitless. So in my mind, I'm like, tell everyone everything. They can try and copy it. And if they beat me, then they deserve to beat me. You know, if not, then it is what it is. Yeah, I had the exact same conversation with a good friend of mine, Andy Fursella. And he says, like, so many people try to copy him in different things that he mm -hmm. does, right? Whether it's the coaching, whether it's the, you know, going through and doing stuff at, through first form or whatever he's working on. But people don't really understand that, for you personally to get better, it's not what they're doing now. It was it was in their playbook five years ago, yeah. and you don't have the same circumstances. You don't have the same setup. You don't have the same support system. There's so many different things. So there's bits and pieces you can learn from, and that's why I always love seeing people win around me, and I don't get discouraged by it. I don't create. It doesn't create animosity for me, or it doesn't create jealousy or envy. What it does is I feel like high tide raises all ships. It, as long as it's legitimate because there's you know mm. there, you know there's so much bullshit out there right yeah. so with gurus of uh, whether they're nutrition gurus whether they're in entrepreneurial gurus but i feel like so many people will just try to turn around for short periods of time and try to copy something that somebody else is doing and either people will eventually see right through it because it's not genuine and it, it's not sustainable because you can when you copy something it's just not sustainable yeah and then you turn around and or if it's something that is just doesn't pertain to you, but you're trying to take bits and pieces from something you saw. And then you're trying to think that that's going to make you just as successful as the person that you're looking at that's doing it. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like that is just the opposite of what people should do. They should just really look internally and figure out, Hey, look, what do I have to work within and be able to grow through? And right now with everything that's going on with this Olympia, we just started, you know, prep per se. And when I say prep, we're at 16 weeks out. You haven't started your official diet yet. You're out here so that we can train. How was the workout yesterday, by the way? It was good. Really good. Feel good? A little beat up from the flight more than anything, but managed to still get a really good workout in. Yeah. Even how fucked my shoulders get when I fly. Yeah. So you were on Monday. You had a, how many hour flight was it from, from there? Six or seven? No, like five and a bit. Five and a bit? Because you went from Port St. Lucie? Um, Miami to Vegas. Oh, Miami to Vegas. Yeah. And then there for the GNC convention was there for a couple of days and then you turn that flight around and then came here to mm -hmm. Dallas. And, um, that was like a couple of days later, Wednesday night. And now that you're here again, we talked about like, okay, let's really kick off this year. Um, you know, you've been training hard. You've been being very, very on top of your program right now, but do you feel any difference on how you're feeling in the gym now that Bradley's born, has that been something different? Because people keep asking me that. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, we, you know, I'll let Chris answer that question. Do you feel any different? Do you feel like, you know, how, you know, Phil would be or Jay would be? Jay would always be his best when he was chasing the Olympia title. Phil was somebody that was had to go into like that dream killer mentality. Uh, is your mentality changed at all since Bradley's born? Or is it still kind of like, I'm? is it just, we're, I guess you, I'll let you explain it. What is it? I mean, I don't feel like I have a whole brand new philosophy of training and life and what I think in there, but there I have had moments where, first of all, in the time standpoint, where you, I'm going, I'm taking really longer rest points, just like kind of taking my time. Now I'm like, the longer I take here, the longer it takes me to get home. So I'm going to move through this workout more efficiently and like mm -hmm. time my rest and be more efficient and get home to my family. And there's also moments of just understanding, like I have a child now who's going to look back at my career and see everything and be like, how hard did I work to achieve something? And whether or not they're, they're never going to know how hard I actually worked. And it's not, maybe it's going to show, maybe it's not going to show in the pictures, but like you can't tell, but I'll know in myself when I'm telling them to work harder, when I'm trying to get them to be their best self, I will know that I've gone through that myself and how hard it was for me to get through something. And when I'm pushing them to be the best version of themselves, it's not just from a place of like 
be your best self. It's like, no, I've been there. I've done it. I've done it all. I know how hard this is. I trust me, I know. And I'll be able to relate to them and hopefully push her to be her best self in the future and be able to be honest when I say I tried my hardest at something and, you know, in the, in the end got the achievement I wanted. So that's been on my mind a few times, not every time I'm training, but maybe on days I'm tired or whatever, it's just like, all right, how's it going to feel when I talk to Bradley as an adult and she's going through something like I'm going through and I'm able to relate because I was there. Did I give my all or did I kind of half-ass my workouts and I didn't really work hard and what am I going to, what standard am I going to hold myself to and what standard I'm going to hold her to as well. And then on top of that, do you feel that now, do you, have to focus on the business stress of it because i know you have dom you have matt right mm -hmm. and they're a very obviously important parts of the business but with you what is your take on it what is your job just right now feeling like okay i can do just the prep and let them worry about the different aspects of the business because again you're such a big part of that mm -hmm. what what is that like because you know with bum energy raw all the things that you're dialed into yeah. Yeah. No, honestly, this is the most I've, the least involved I've been. Okay. And it's been great. And part of that is a bit of my mindset that I also shifted before Bradley came in and then after was I care a little bit less. I care a little bit less about like X amount of money and like this, like fine tuning this for extra pennies and extra dollars. And it's like, I really care about my brand and how it's presented and having a good company, but really caring about like top line revenue is like this big deal. It's like, it doesn't really matter as much to me anymore because I know my family doesn't need that much money, like infinite amounts of money. So it doesn't, it's not going to make them happier. It's not going to bring us closer together. And that mm -hmm. just is the most important thing to me. So it almost devalued how much I care about money a little bit. And it also made me just care less to be like super involved in everything. And I also dropped back in understanding that there's people way better than me at every position in the company. <laughs> there's people who can do everything better than me. And right. there's a vision I have. And, you know, when we sit in meetings, it's, it's more of like a, we have a CMO now who sits in all the marketing meetings with all our agencies and everything. And then he comes back and he talks to us about the direction that we're going to. So instead of him, me sitting through five meetings, he sits through five and then I sit in one with him. Right. And then we have uh, able to create a game plan and he goes and executes. So now I'm in there for two, three hours a day and then I can go train and be able to focus on that. And it's been great. Honestly, I, I, I personally prefer that a lot more. Obviously if I'm going to be bodybuilding and doing business, I have to prioritize bodybuilding. Otherwise I'm going to lose Olympia. It's not some hobby for me. I'm trying to be the best in the world. So I have to push everything out of the way and focus on that. And I've been doing that a lot more now. And honestly, it's been great. I enjoy it. And like you said, I have such an amazing team for it. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. I have like the three companies under the roof. I have the app. I have YouTube. I have all these things. And there's someone who kind of runs it all for me, essentially. And I trust them completely to do it. And I'm so grateful to have such amazing people in my life that I can just literally check in on them every now and then and I know it's being executed needs to be executed. So it's definitely something, the only reason I'm able to do all that and be a bodybuilder and a dad that I'm proud to be is because of all the amazing people in my life. Even Courtney being the mom she is makes 100%. it so much easier for me to just know that my child is perfectly taken care of and I'm going to come home and my wife's still going to be happy and not like stressed out and, you know, embrace me into the home and be happy that we're all together. And all those things relieve so much off of me. So yeah, I'm super blessed for the amount of amazing people in my life. Otherwise, I'd be probably doing one thing instead of six things. So Yeah. Very well, lucky. again, I've, I've talked about it, whether it's my wife, your wife. Um, so it's like Courtney, Fairness, all of them. It's like we're, we wouldn't be where we're at without them because it allows us to do what we do. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's so important to be able to have a really good partner to be able to handle that because now, again, mom mode. You know, yeah, it's like she's going to be like, you know, taken yeah. care of and you don't have to stress about that. It's crazy. Yeah. No, she's such a champ. There's some times where like I will have a busy day. Yeah. Maybe I get back from a trip and then a bunch of meetings and then a bunch of stuff going on. And then I get to the gym and I'm in the gym like, fuck, I feel tired. And then I get a text from Courtney and she's like, oh my God, Bradley's been crying and puking all day, like all this shit. And then I feel guilty I'm not home with her and I have all this shit on me and I'm in the gym and I'm like, fuck. And then, and then she'll like be like, I know you're in the gym right now. You need to focus. Like kick ass in the gym, do what you need to do. And then when you get home, like be with us. And she'll like know that I'm thinking that and she'll like send that text. And I'm like, she just knows, you know, she's such a champ. So right. super grateful that she gives me permission to go out and work hard. And she knows the more that she gives me like the grace to do what I do and the trust to take care of her and provide how I do, yeah. the more excited I am to come home and be present and loving with my family. So it's kind of like a cycle, you know, a lot of people will nag, nag on each other. And the more you nag, the less likely I want to come home and like, I still will, but like you kind of come home with a bit of like, fuck, what am I walking into rather than like a, you're rushing home to get back to your family. So it's, it's a nice little cycle that 
it's not we're not perfect we have days absolutely where it's like just chaos and stress and no sleep and all this stuff but overall we try and catch ourselves and then be better the next time that we go through a similar situation yeah i think that's a really good way of putting it because that cycle that you just mentioned is so important because if you go home to some hostility or aggression mm-hmm. or whatnot, then it puts you on edge going, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Do I want to go home? Do I want to go home? Should I go later? I want to spend less time. Subconsciously, you're like driving a little slower. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, or yeah. I'm going to stay an extra day and on the trip because, you know, or come home at night and I don't want everyone's already sleeping. Mm-hmm. It's just all of these things because I've been there, done that. Like I've yeah. traveled a lot and you're like, God, I'm not there physically with you, but I'm trying to be there for you. Um emotionally when I can be and you're and being present, but also trying to provide. And I think that balancing of providing as men, we, it it makes it very difficult because what we're trying to do is we're trying to just provide Mm -hmm. and we don't understand how much is needed in regards to being able to be that emotional soundboard that women, you know, that our partners need. And you're trying to do that, but we also know that inherently we need to go out there and hunt Mm -hmm. and we need to bring back the food. We need to bring back the cash to pay for the house and to pay for all of the expenses and to be able to do those things. But they also need the ancillary like, hey, look, I need that emotional support. I need you to be there. And that was so very hard for me personally because I, you know, I am so like when I'm locked into something, I'm locked into it. So it's really hard for me to be present in so many different things. Mm -hmm. I think you're much, much better at it than I am. But it's something that I had to, you know, um, I had to learn and I'm still trying to continue to learn. And I think coming out here to, to Dallas has helped me quite a bit because it got us out of the matrix yeah. of California. The where environment is huge. Huge. Yeah. The community, mm-hmm. you know, and, and all of those things. But like you said, you know, having Maddie and all of those guys and that Calvin and all, you know, your crew and all of these people that you have to lean on and the rest of your team that you got to lean on. Because if you feel like you can trust that team, it allows you to go back to center faster. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so all, all of those things being put aside now. Do you feel like you're still in that same situation that we talked about a couple of years ago that at when you're done, you want to take your phone and throw it into a lake and just go up and move out to Montana? <laughs> and you're going to be like, find you on a ranch, find you on a mountain somewhere? I want to. I imagine I still won't be able to. You know, I still do love my businesses, and a lot of that is obviously tied to everything else I do online. But eventually I feel like I also want to not have to do anything. You know, we talked about this. The second I feel like I have to do something, it's like I don't want to do it anymore. That's your personality. Yeah, I'm like absolutely not. I want to feel like everything is my choice of what I get to <laughs> do. I don't want to feel like constrained to anything. So wait, even like, I mean, bodybuilding, being able to understand that it's my choice and I'm choosing to do everything rather than feeling like I have, to, I have to diet, I have to prep, I have to go to the gym. But actually being, not just lie to myself, but to understand, like to get down to like, as I come to the truth of where I am, I, I am choosing to do everything that's in my life. I'm choosing to do X, Y, and Z, you know? So as long as I don't feel like I have to be on my phone and I'm like sucked into it or I have to be on social media, then I'm good. As long as it's a choice, then I'm okay. And that's why like everything I do, it's why I'm, I chopped up all my contracts, everyone I worked with. I was like, no, I'm not being held to anything. <laughs> I'm like, I'll take half the salary and not have to do it. I just don't want to do it. And people are like, all right, fair enough. Then and, and I just chopped everything out there like that. And that's why I wanted to own my own business, not feel like I was controlled by anything. And you know, I'm excited to get to work and do what I have to do. But mm-hmm. I think I want to, I think we, we did a podcast with some of Calvin's buddies, some Navy SEALs. Mm-hmm. And the guy talked about having a dial, you know, and mm-hmm. ex-military doing intense stuff. He's still with training and a lot of intense things. And having a dial when you go overseas and then come back to your family, it's a huge, like, a dial that we can never understand of having to switch back. But that analogy to me was really important for me to like understand when I can go into something and then be able to come back. So I would like to be able to like live in the mountains, but I'd be able to drive an hour into the city where I can do what I need to do. And then in that drive home, I can dial it down, you know, put your phone on airplane mode for the night and just be at home and detach from the world. So as much as I would love to be a complete recluse, there is a part of me that still loves everything I do. So finding the balance and the ability to be able to dial on that social thing and then dial it off and come home and be the peace is something that I imagine I'll have to continue to work on. Yeah, and you earn that balance, right? Yeah. You've done it through years and years and years of hard work. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think, oh, you got to balance from the beginning. You can't balance from the beginning. No, yeah. You have I'm not, that's why I'm saying I've got to, when I'm retired in the future, right. in a couple of years from now, when I'm, I got to start learning that better because you're right, when you're in the midst of it, there's not really much balance. No, and that's why I think your tone has changed. Because I think that now that you're realizing that you actually have balance and you've earned it and you're mm-hmm. learning how to balance it, you're actually saying, hey, I want to go into the mountains, but I'm going to come back. 
where two years ago we were on the podcast and you're like, I'm taking my phone, I'm throwing it away. <laughs> Nobody can get a hold of me, yeah, this and that. I, because you wanted to just check out because you know you had to stay in. Yeah. So then you wanted to go the opposite route. Yeah. Now that you know you don't have to and you have control, now you're like, oh, okay, I think, you know, I'm going to have to balance this out. Okay, it's not that bad. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, for right? sure. You know, you're right. Yeah. So, and I think, you know, going into this generation of athletes too, because what it takes me into is this, like, you used to be the young guy, okay? Yeah. And now you're not the young Tell guy. Tell me anymore, about it. You know? <laughs> now you're, like, considered one of the veterans, one of the elder, you know, the elders. I'm the old guy. Yeah. Well, I don't know about old, but I would say that you're seasoned. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I'm not talking about just on stage in the Mr. Olympia competition. I'm talking about, for example, last night we trained, we're going and got something to eat. You know, somebody always recognizes you, but now you have young kids that are not much older than my son mm -hmm. that know who you are. My question for you is how do you perceive that? When it comes in, what what's your perception of this, these young kids that know you, and how do you think you relate to these people? That and why do they know you? Like, what is your perception on that? What's my? What do you mean by my perception like, on them? What? How, first of all, how do you feel about that? That they that like such young people know you, mm -hmm. and I guess let's start there. And then the second portion of my question is, how how do you? feel like, I guess, you connect with that audience, right? So yeah. it's kind of like, you know, this 16-year-old that knows who you are, that's still in high school, that's a sophomore, junior year in high school. I know it kind of, how does that make you feel that somebody that's literally almost half your age now is connected to you? Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I see really young kids, I'm like shocked. <clears throat> but... I've said, I've said this before, and I do feel like it's like a responsibility on me, mm -hmm. for sure. I don't I don't like being too preachy, and like I was talking about, like people pushing out like five step programs to be like this. I feel like it doesn't weigh as much as someone showing it through action, and it's hard to not be able to communicate. And I still do talk about a lot of what I do, but I really try and like live a life that I think people would live up to and be happy when they get there. You know, you see a lot of people who like sacrifice, like I spoke about sacrifice marriages relationships everything just to win and then they're miserable in the end and those are the people that we look up to and then we chase and we live their life and we're also miserable in the end so i don't want to be someone where these young kids are looking up to me and i'm like acting and being in this way that's going to lead them down the wrong path and it's the same way i view being a dad now you know there's all the world things in the world that i can tell bradley to do and to be but at the end of the day she's probably going to mirror the way that me and her mom act and how we live and what her the experience there's, on, there's only so much we can say that she'll listen to but it's what we do that's more important so I really feel like the way I portray myself on social media and the way I live and the way I act and with a lot of these young men looking up to me, I just hope that I can be someone that they look up to and if they want to become that, then when they are, they're happy. And that's why I try and share like ups and downs and hard times, you know. There are times I'm emotional and I'm vulnerable and I cry and those times are okay, but it doesn't mean that I quit and I give up. It just means that you're having a shitty day and things are hard and you accept that they are. You sit in them, you allow those emotions to come out. I try and talk about how much I lean on Courtney because to me relationships are so important. I'm not really for this whole like Sigma male mentality that a lot of these kids have, which is like the lone wolf. Like you don't need anybody. You just rely on yourself. The whole like love for Batman and everything. Mm -hmm. I'm not really like that at all. I'm a huge believer in if you have safe, connected relationships that those make you so much better and elevate you way more and driving yourself through a place where you already have self-worth rather than you're seeking self-worth through your success leads you even farther. So I try and communicate about these things and show these things really because I know a lot of these kids who look up to people online want to be and act like them. So the way I act will dictate how others will as well. So I, I do feel a heavy responsibility on that, but I also know that well, the way I'm working is to be my best self. So I believe if they do the same, it'll be for them to be their best self. You know, I do a lot of self-work, obviously, with my life coach, therapist, Jordan, and mm -hmm. me and Courtney do a lot of stuff for our relationship and just being the best that we can. And then on the side, I'm working to be Mr. Olympia, but underneath it all is being my best self underneath it and trying to show that as much as I possibly can. So if you have a 16-year-old who doesn't have a Courtney because, you know, they're not married, probably don't, you know, if they have a girlfriend, somebody in high school, yep. who do you think that they should lean on? What, who, what's your recommendation for somebody like that? that can be able to lean on someone similar to who you do, I mean, what you do with Courtney. It's definitely hard when you're a young age and 
the reason like I talk about how important that is now is because I didn't feel like I really had anyone to lean on at the time. My sister was pretty good at that. My parents as well, but I feel like we come from a generation where you didn't really communicate a lot with your parents about that stuff, and I'm starting to more now, but it was more so like my sister or no one. And, you know, my friends didn't talk about shit, and we just didn't. And that's hard when you're young, and, like, sometimes it just it is what it is. If you're able to have one good friend, you know, one sibling, one parent that you can lean on, then you're lucky. But sometimes you don't. And sometimes the beginning isn't the same as the end and you got to get through it in a different way and it's harder and it feels like shit, but you understand that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And even when like I talk about the way I act and the way I found Courtney, the way Courtney found me was because I put a video up on YouTube crying about losing the Olympia and being sick and being in the hospital and having my autoimmune disease and being really vulnerable. And that was what attracted her and why she fell in love with me, not because I was some big macho like Mr. Olympia dude. It was that I had lost and that I was sharing something that was really difficult and scary for me. And she felt like I was real, authentic, emotional, and strong because I had gotten through it. So her seeing that was the kind of woman I attracted. Where if I'm putting out this fake image of like, I'm rich, I'm successful, I'm jacked, I have, I have all X, Y, and Z, then I'm going to put out an image that's going to attract a woman who wants that. And that woman is probably not going to be someone that I can lean on heavily in hard times and who's going to love me in hard times. Because if I lose everything, that's, well, that's what she was attracted to me for. The attractions are gone. So I think sometimes maybe you got to get through that hard time and just like believe in yourself, understand that it's going to end eventually. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, life can be hard at times. You push yourself through. And if you're lucky enough to have people you can lean on, then count your blessings. And if not, sometimes you just got to become someone who will attract the people into your life and forge those relationships over time. Because I'm not going to be ignorant enough to say everyone has that one person because some people don't. Right. But you can find those people. And if you're able to work on yourself enough and get through to be in the right position, you'll attract them. And then you nourish that relationship and you build it over time. Well, I think that there's something to saying that also those that don't have somebody find the gym. Right. Yeah. So breakups make bodybuilders. <laughs> yeah. Right. Breakups make bodybuilders even better because you just take out that frustration, that anger. I know I went through a breakup once mm -hmm. way, way back uh, right out of high school. And it was something where I'm like, I don't know what was going on at the time, but I just couldn't, didn't have the coping ability to cope outside of the gym. But luckily I had the gym. So I was just able to get a lot of that just anger, frustration out. Um, but it was funny because later on <laughs> I ran into her in the gym and she's like, Hey, you're looking good. Da, da, da. And then she wanted to get, like yeah. get back together. And then at that time I'm like, Oh, we'll see. <laughs> <Not anymore. laughs> but it was one of those things where I'm just like, especially like I said, right out of high school. Yeah. But if you turn around and you're giving inspiration to these kids, I think that it's something that to be said that taking out the frustration and getting the coping mechanisms built in is very, very important because I feel like they just so many of them don't have that. And that's one of the reasons why they you know, they go, Oh, this person's a snowflake or this, this generation's a snowflake or what's going on. Mm -hmm. Because I think that in a lot of ways have not been instilled in them for whatever reason that we had. Right. And I'm quite a bit older than you, but it's one of those things that we just had to deal with a tough shit. And on top of that, I came from an immigrant family, right? Mm -hmm. So that was even tougher. Like my parents didn't know how to speak English. They were like learning English while they were, you know, going to school here. And then it was even, even tougher for that. But I feel that as you turn around and you are here and sometimes um, you're dealing with that connectivity, do you, do you feel like that there's something that you can give these kids that they feel like they can be able to teach them how to cope um, do you feel like the gym thing would be something there or is there other things that you can think of to be able to help with all of these things because of social media being so toxic most mm -hmm. of the time? Is it, is it just understanding the fil and filtering the information you're seeing or is there anything else that you can add to that? No, I, I completely agree that the gym is a, like a good start. I think like you spoke about a lot of people releasing frustration at the gym, but sometimes it's people, not that they're frustrated, but they just have no self-confidence and they don't know why. And I feel like a lot of that, like you kind of mentioned, is people don't go through hard shit anymore. And I think there's a lot of meaning and personal growth and you know self-actualization just through going through something very hard. So if you're going through something hard mentally and then you find the gym and you put yourself through something even harder and you keep pushing yourself into doing hard things and you understand what it takes to get through those, you know, 
every time I've had like a really bad injury, ended up in the hospital, gone through really intense things. And when I come out on the other end, I have a different view on myself and myself within reality and the way I view the world. And I grow from that and I become a better, stronger, more confident person. You know, I, uh, if I got through that, I can get through this. You know, you keep growing and getting better. So putting yourself into doing something difficult, I believe makes you better, builds confidence. And then that can put you into a position to be able to actually build relationships because you have more confidence to either communicate, attract the right person, whatever it may be. And I, I spoke about this in a video a while ago where people find the gym and they use it to suppress things, mm -hmm. which is great for a time. You know, I think, like I said, the way you start things doesn't have to be the way you end things. I don't think going to the gym for your entire life every time you feel like shit and just instead of doing anything about it, you just go to the gym and forget about it. I don't think that's the right to do, thing to do. You know, you need to be able to think about it enough to understand it about it enough to act on it. I don't think you should think on it forever either because then you're just stuck in your negative thoughts. But you need to think about it enough so that you understand it so you understand how to fix it. But people who just every time they feel like shit, they just go to the gym, forget about it, and then distract themselves on their phone and stay busy. I'm like, the gym helps me mentally, but I'm going to have a breakdown in 10 years from now because I still haven't thought about this thing that's really stressing me out from the other day. I think that can become a crutch, but I think it's a great way to start. So I think as long as you can start there, you get in the gym, and like I said, you maybe do some bunch of hard shit where you build enough confidence to be able to do something about it then it's just kind of the ladder along the way. So, you know, I, I try not to just say go to the gym and suppress everything, but it's a great way to start and build self-confidence and put yourself into a position where you can grow, get through enough time where you're old enough, have enough resources, tools, whatever, where you can actually go back and handle whatever was causing you so much stress. Yeah, and I think that the other thing that the gym can do is also allow you to take out frustration and anger so you do not respond in an emotional way. Yeah. Because if you're emotional... 90% of the time, if you respond while that emotion's at its height, you're going to make the wrong decision on what you're about to say or do. Mm -hmm. But if you can go to the gym, get that emotional response to be able to be basically reduced so it's not so much of a snapback, but you gives yourself some time to give yourself perspective on the situation, you're going to make a better choice on how to respond to whatever is going on in your life For at sure. that time. Yeah. You know, but, um, Going back to the younger generation, 16, 18, 22, you're starting to see when you were coming up the mullet, because you brought this up with Cam, right? And you're like talking about hair. Yeah. And I see these kids that are coming. I mean, what is your take on this? Like, you know, I guess when they were following you and they were doing like the mullet and then now the alpaca hair is very in. <laughs> what's, what's your take on that? These trends, these I don't new get trends. In trouble by saying anything here. <laughs> But I can't, I can't judge anyone's haircut considering I had a mullet, I had an undercut, I had a Viking beard, I had all these things I look back on. And I'm like, I was in college chasing after girls as this dude was completely sh like sh bick shaved undercut head, slicked back hair like Tom, what's his name? The guy from Fury, Brad Pitt from Fury. Okay. And then just this Viking beard. And I yeah. was like, I look like an absolute like maniac. I look it's terrifying. And I'm there trying to attract women. So the mullet was better than that at least. It was a little less scary, but it's still like a mullet. So I can't judge, you know? I'll sit here and say I don't like their haircut, but I mean, they didn't like mine, and my parents hated it too. So <laughs> it is with just generations. I was giving Cam a hard time because I said to him, I said, look, dude, I don't want, you, I don't want my son to look like a poodle. Yeah. And that was the thing, right? But it's the new thing because yeah. I didn't even know that they permed it. I thought it was just guys that were I didn't know they some... permed it either. Yeah. And... When I had the mullet, my barber said people used to come in and ask for my hair, my haircut. And then they would ask why it didn't look like it. He's like, well, Chris has curly hair, like wavy hair. He's like, you can perm it. And then he said the kids came back next time with a perm, and he like, didn't expect them to do it. He was half joking. So that's pretty crazy. That is yeah. crazy. So do you? Um, what's going on this year? What do you think this year looks like for you? Are you looking like going into this year goals? What would, you know, we, the first year we worked together obviously was very tough for me. Because again, we were short on time yeah. <laughs> with all the things that happened and how we ended up working together. Uh, and then the very last moment, um, Calvin jinxed it and you tore your bicep. So that's all on you, Calvin. I got to blame you for something on this Never podcast. let that one down. No, never ever. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden, um, you know, I felt like though when I look back at the pictures, right? And I said, what we were able to get to, to do in those 14, 15 weeks that we were working together. I was really happy with. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, a little bit of the mind fuck was there on the bicep situation, the last minute. Yeah. But when you look at it, I thought conditioning was better. I thought some things just you had a little bit better presence uh, in regards to the separation and and the balance between fullness and conditioning. 
then last year, obviously we had the torn lath that everybody, you know, you've been very open about yeah. now. <laughs> we didn't no talk about it at the time. Anymore. No secret anymore. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just looking back at it and going, holy shit, I remember it was pretty emotional. That was a fucking crazy time, yeah. There's yeah. some shit we, I, have, I haven't talked about that was mixed in with that. Yeah. That I won't talk about because it's not mine to talk about, but right. that was added to that chaos, yeah. There was, yeah, so... Oof, yeah, so going back and, you know, reliving that for the last, um, you know, few seconds just now for me. Yeah. But going into it now, that was number five. I guess now going for number six, what are your goals, right? Like, obviously, it's a bit different because we're working together. and But to share with the audience kind of your, your perspective on this, going into the Olympia, um. I have a feeling I know what you're looking to do. And I know that when I look at your physique, I go, okay, I like the conditioning of 22. Mm -hmm. I like the fullness of 23. And I would love to have a combination of both because we did get a couple of pounds where a lot of other people ended up getting eight pound <laughs> boost. Yep. You, got, you got less than one kilo. You got two pounds. But we try to utilize as much of that as possible. Um, but I guess in your mind's eye, what is the goal for you know, six to, for the next 16 weeks in regards to the overall look and, and feel of everything. I would say similar. I feel, I remember when we started working together and you mentioned like it was all risk, no reward for you working with me mm -hmm. because if I lost, it was your fault. And if I won, I would have won anyways. Right. And I feel like I've gotten better over every single year and continue to do so working with you. So it's kind of proven that us working together, you are making me better. So that pressure I feel like is now flipped it's still, of course, it's still on you, but now I feel like there's a lot of pressure flipped on me, and it's just about does Chris still want it? This mm -hmm. just Chris still want it bad enough? Why is he still doing another one? Why would he go for six? Why would he go for seven? Why is he still doing it? And is he hungry enough to beat these guys who are hungry as hell, been behind him for five, six years trying to kick his ass? So I feel like there's definitely a lot of pressure on that, and with that pressure that comes from that, I just feel so so much less of it than I have in the past so much less external pressure than I do on myself of just wanting this to be my best year yet. I had all these things that were going on. 2021, that sh absolute chaos. 2022, the bicep tear. 2023, the lat tear. I've just had all these things kind of hit me, and I just really want this year to be my best year. And like you said, I want to be able to combine the conditioning of 22 with the size of 23 and more and just come in at my absolute best. And, you know, I think we're lined up to be able to do so this year. And... I want to also be able to be able to apply all the things I've learned about my body physically and mentally and be able to do that this year. I think last year, the end of that prep was one of the best I ever finished mentally. You know, given what we had gone through and how shitty I felt at 10 weeks out mentally, my the way I was able to bring my mind back by the end, I was just in such a good place. And I also realized in talking to Jordan as well, my therapist, she realized like she's like, Sometimes, I don't think it's purposefully, maybe subconsciously, definitely accidentally sometimes, you put yourself in this hole where you're just like, I feel like shit, the cards are stacked against me, all this stuff, and then you're like, now I can start. <laughs> you know, it's like I put, and we've talked about this yes. too, it's like yeah. I almost like I sabotage myself, do. so I get this little edge and this hunger, like, well, now I'm behind, so i got to kick ass, and I thrive under that pressure. I'm like, <laughs> everything's stacked against me, I'm like, well, watch me now. So my goal this year is to not put myself in that hole. And to be able to still lift myself up just from, you know, like my pride and what I can do, my passion for wanting to be my best and everything I've learned over the years, being able to apply that and be able to end it physically, mentally in a good, safe, happy, confident, successful place in the end of my prep and enjoy it, you know, take it all in. And when I, I always say I want to be able to enjoy my prep and have fun with it and be happy and all this shit. And I don't think I ever really elaborate that I mean like over the whole I don't mean like I'm going to be happy smiling the whole way through. I want there to be those days where I feel like shit and I want to quit. And because those are the days I wake up the next day when I didn't and I feel good about myself. I, I like the ups and downs. Mm -hmm. I just don't want any deep holes where I'm like turning resentful to the sport for what it's the pressure it's putting on me. I want that pressure to come from myself and my excitement to be my best and just to live through it like that, you know, and look back at the end of this year and be like, you know, I, I went through some some hard shit. I pushed myself harder than ever before. And, you know, I had those bad days. I didn't quit on myself on those days. And in the end, here I am. We're less stressed than we have been in the past. In the yeah. end, we enjoy it. And I look my best and, you know, we top it off like that. So it's something that's really important to me. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that in the past, you almost try to set yourself up to almost 
wind yourself up mm -hmm. to be able to go. Yeah. And the way you would do that would be, I'm going to take a long break. I'm going to try to not put too much pressure because if I feel like if I'm taking the longer break, I'm going to then feel urgency and urgency can turn into anxiety very quickly. Yeah. And I felt like you fed off of that. Mm -hmm. And that's what motivated you to be able to go next level with the training. And you're like, oh, I'm already close to the weight cap or I, I don't want to put on too much size. I don't want to do this or I don't want to do that. And then it was kind of a way of being able to cope with the stress. Yeah. And where I was like, if you can prepare properly, you can be less stressed. Like, Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was one of those things that I'm like, but now I've definitely seen that turn because you're being more proactive about it. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you can definitely see that even having Bradley, I was always wondering like, okay, what's going to happen here? Yeah, Is he going to just basically give me a call and say, no, I think I'm going to take it. We're done. No, I'm ready to take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm seeing in terms of the difference of being able to kind of rev things up because I could feel that you want to be able to be your best ever yeah. versus someone saying that I'm going to be at my best ever, but they're not doing all the things that they need to do to become their best ever. Yeah. So sure. there's a lot of people I've worked with and there's a lot of people in the industry and there's a lot of people just in the sports environment that outwardly project and say things and they come across as very, very just egotistical mm -hmm. and it comes from this, you know, a side of anxiety. Right. Yeah. And then people turn around and be like, oh, that guy's just cocky bastard. Well, it's because he's just has anxiety, social anxiety of some sort, or he has anxiety and he's just projecting. Mm -hmm. And I felt like you've just really kind of just transformed that a bit. And now I'm starting to see it because you're like doing all of the things proactively so that you can say, hey, look, I'm cutting down the amount of work. I'm turning around. I'm balancing things out. Yeah. I'm making sure I'm training. I'm out here at 16 weeks out. So it took me until six weeks to cut down work and like four weeks out to come down here last year. So <laughs> we're ahead of the game already. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, there was time last year you were just like, well, we don't know if you're going to do the show. When but, I hurt myself. Yeah. Yeah. 10 yeah. weeks out. Yeah. It's like, we may not be able to do the show because if you can't train, how are you going to get ready for a competition? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, I mean, you're the good, but you're any that good. So, <laughs> so, we'll never but, know. but you healed up. Yeah. And that's what happened. Luckily, I healed up. Yeah, you did. For sure. I've definitely had a, when you're talking about people who outwardly say, like, I'm going to win, I want to do X, Y, and Z, I've definitely almost, like, felt some of that over my career and held it in a lot mm -hmm. because I don't want to put anything out into the world until I've done it. You know, and, like, I force myself to talk more and to say more because I know it's people, like, following the journey and it helps other people and it, it creates more of a story along the way. But, like, I hate being that, like, preachy person who's, like, saying things without doing them. I... Like I kind of like kind of just keeping things under wraps and how I feel. And I'm almost scared sometimes to be like, I'm going to win and I'm going to this. And I'm not because I'm like, you don't know. You're, you got to earn it first. And I think over the years I've struggled with whether or not I should. You know, all the champions in the past, all these people who have always said, I'm only here to win. I'm going to win the Olympia. I already know I've won the Olympia. You know, I'm manifesting it, all that shit. And I'm like, should I think like that? And, you know, along the way, my whole thing with champion mentality has been, the only thing a champion does is what a champion does. You know, you make your own rules. You do whatever the hell it takes to be a champion for yourself. And for myself, it is believing that I can win, but it's not saying I am going to win because I have to prove it first. You know, I, I have to go and do the work. I have to be living it and feeling it, not saying it out loud. And that's always been something very important to me. And honestly, it probably comes from my dad because he didn't speak a lot ever, but he always executed, you know. He had philosophies and he, we, I knew what was important to him in life and he always acted in the way that his values came first. But he didn't say his values. I just knew what his values were given how he acted. And that was always super important to me. So, you know, I definitely talk way more than him and still preach more than him. But I still try and apply that into my life. And I think it it helps me keep some of the pressure under wraps and the focus where it needs to be. Yeah, it's just so funny that you mentioned that about your dad. Because I look and I see bits and pieces of you, you know, like your father's similarities. <laughs> yeah. But again, you're, you, you, you talk a lot more than your dad does. Mm -hmm. But he just like the things that he says are just so like right spot on. Yeah. And then he, it's just like, you sit back and you're like, yeah, he yeah. gets it. He's <laughs> right? just, this is like such He'll say a one sentence and you're like, he understands everything going on right now. He just doesn't feel the need to say it. A hundred percent. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And you were just up there seeing him 
for his work anniversary, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that was that was cool to see. In Canada. Obviously, he's 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 getting up there in age, but he's retiring finally. And he's how, been how old your dad now? Uh, Mid sixties. Okay. He's still young. Yeah, he's still young. Yeah, but he worked really hard to become the CIO of where he worked. So it was a big deal, and he was enjoying it. He was he was a really good leader too, and so I wanted to go down there and for his retirement party. Right. They were doing like a little surprise presentation, and to me, it felt very important to to go down and see my dad get his flowers. You know, to think of my child coming to see me. Maybe like if I were to retire and my child would be there and witness it, they'll be too young, obviously, but that would be something very important for your son to see how hard you've worked and to see people like pay you respect and homage to how hard you've worked and how much you've helped them. So I flew down there pretty much just to see him. He had no idea too. When we walked in the room, he looked over. He's like, and he waves and just smiles, just so happy to see his family there. Because like his values, family number one, always. Just time with family is the most important thing. And he he never had to say it. It just we just knew that what he cared about the most. He didn't care if it was only an hour out of the month or if it was a day or two or what we were doing. As long as we were together, it meant a lot to him. So you know, it was very very special moment and very happy to go down there and say that and he was texting me after he's like i can't believe you were here like i'll never forget this i'm so grateful you came and you know a couple of people gave speeches about him talking about the kind of leader he was and even even the guy giving a speech about him said something like we all know jeff isn't a big talker but every he always knows what's going on everything he says is super important and we all shut up and we listen because what he says has an impact and then he got up there and he gave a little speech and he he always gave he gave a speech at one event I saw him at, at my sister's wedding, and then here I saw him, and it was like, he just kills it. He doesn't over-ramble anything. He's got a couple quotes that fit so perfectly. And I was like, why are you such a better talker than me, and you barely talk? You know, Maybe there's something I need to take from that. But it was really cool to go down there and kind of experience all of that and be there with my family. So that was a lot of fun. It was a short trip, but I'm trying to fly them down to Florida. Is it July already? In this Next month? In next July. week. Next week? Shit. Yeah, soon. <laughs> Trying to bring them down, you know. Are they gonna are they gonna move down there full time near you? I don't think they'll move down full time. Maybe if we were somewhere without so much heat, so if we ever leave Florida, but he hates they both hate like hundred degree humidity yeah, all the, the humidity time. Kills you and too. they they have a nice cottage on the lake, so and my sister's still in Canada, so I imagine they'll come back and forth for a while until my goal is to be able to like build enough providing for my family that I can provide more of my extended family and bring everybody to the same place. So that's, that's honestly cool goals on. right there. Yeah. That's where everyone says, Oh, what is it? You know, it's cool to have cool cars. Mm -hmm. It's cool to have a big house or a nice house. Um, it's cool to have those things. But I think the biggest thing is to provide for your family and your extended family so that you can create that sense of community Yeah, because they're literally the people that you can lean on and for most. sure. I mean, if there's anyone I want Bradley growing up around, it's my parents, my sister, Ian, yeah. you know, my, my family. That's, they grew up, I grew up around them. We all have similar values and family is very important to me. So I'd like to get a compound. You know, we'll put a 50 foot wall around 50 acres and then just have like five houses in there and we'll just live in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can be able to hunt and fish and you're going to be able to yeah. do all, all the things that you like to do. Have a racetrack in one corner and, you know, <laughs> basketball hoop over there. You've been mentioning race tracks so much. That honestly, I think while you're here, because you're gonna be here for a couple more days, I think we should go karting. Go karting? Yeah. I thought you were gonna say go to the real track with your GT3, but GT3. I mean, it's it's a hundred degrees outside. Yeah, the tires are gonna get like super super greasy. Do you have fast go karts here, or like the yeah. little kid ones? No, they got some fast ones here. I'm down to try. But yeah, we yeah. should go. I'm down. Yeah, because you've been mentioning like track, 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 track. <laughs> We've been talking about it for so. I think long. I saw some Courtney something like a Zillow of like a twenty million dollar home with like a. Was a track in the backyard, and I was like, "That's just that's goals." You know, I saw it on Instagram. You saw it? Maybe it was on Instagram. Yeah, it was on IG that somebody had like a, I think it was a go kart track or something, or maybe they had a. Well, no, they have a in Southern California near Palm Springs. There is like a community down there that's called Thermal, and that Thermal community has actually houses that are built on the racetrack. So like, and you can go out there, and then you can literally like get on the track. You like you rent a condo. Well, you can buy houses yeah. or rent them, and then they have garages and stuff, and then you can end up becoming a member of that. that yeah. in They'll have like a, a garage with a lift and then like a little house above. It's just like a tall, skinny home yeah. right on the track, and you just go on race cars. Yeah, you got like that whole thing, and you got it. It's like a country club. Yeah. It's a country club, but it's yeah. Badass. But they got a bunch of different stuff like that. But yeah, we got some stuff nearby. We got <laughs> we got to do that because last time we went shooting, you yeah. know, which is always fun too. Yeah. But I think that uh, definitely you've been talking so much about the track. You know, I guess outside of that, just just to add to the to the stuff that you like to do, 
you know, I know you got some cool cars and I always see your um, classic Camaro in there. Out of all of those things, what are the things that you, is going to the track one of the things that you still want to do that you have never done? Yeah, I would like to race like a few physical meaningless things that I won't care if I do or don't do. I would love to like properly learn how to drift a car. Okay. Race one on a track. Love to shoot an RPG at a car. <laughs> an RPG uh, at an a RPG. car. RPG. Okay. Well, Hottie can show you how to do that. I'm sure they do. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> no. You can make that joke. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely the role, you know, the right nationality for that. But um I'll, I'll be honest with you. I I kind of wanted to do that too. I like blowing right. shit up. Like you want to go out there and shoot something and then you, I don't know what that stuff is called. That they, 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 is Tannerite? It? Tannerite. Yeah. And then they put on the back of the, the targets and then they'll blow up. Yeah. Dude, that sound, that looks so cool. Yeah. And then um, I think it was Branch that was telling me that they were shooting like hogs from a helicopter and, you know, because all those yeah. feral hogs here. They do just, that in Florida too. They do that They there? have like $20,000 night vision goggles and scopes and everything just hunting hogs out in the middle of the night. Yeah. Yeah. So tracking. And then shooting an RPG <laughs> at a car. And hunting. And hunting. Yeah. Those are the three. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, I know yeah. I'll definitely go hunting. The other ones we'll see. Yeah. Well. I'm we, sure I'll track a car too. I'm oh, sure. yeah. Well, we can do that. But we should yeah. do that over in Laguna. What we got to do is we get to California and do Laguna Seca. Because you got the seven, you know, it's about seven story drop mm -hmm. through, uh, you know, the uh, corkscrew. And the weather there 90% of the time is like 60 degrees, 70 yeah. degrees. So. That's scary. Yeah, but it's really, it's not scary. It's just one of those things you, once you learn how to do it. Have you ever done it on a video game? Like? To dr drive Laguna Seca Raceway? Oh, no. I would, pro probably, actually, but I, haven't, I don't know. Okay. From You'd Canada, to, we don't know what those things are. Okay. Well, just Laguna, play. Yeah, you just play. Well, there's there's different tracks, right? And there's simulators. That's always fun to do so that you can kind of learn the track. Mm -hmm. And then um, it's once you do it, then you kind of understand it better. Because, again, all the turns. Yeah. But... You know, most tracks have 12, you know, average 12, 13 turns, you know, unless you go like the Nurburgring. Mm. And then they got like a lot more. Chaos, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's I know there's one, there's like a Porsche experience or something near me where they you'll rent a Porsche and yes. then they have a private track up there too. And that's only a couple hours from me, I think, in Florida. Or it's in Virginia maybe above us. They have a couple. I know that there's one in Southern California and there's, prob there's probably more than one, but you can definitely do that. And then they'll give you their cars. You can, yeah. you know, do that through the Porsche. Better do their cars in your own. <laughs> Porsche Experience Center. You don't want to destroy your GT3 yeah. that way. But, um, but yeah, we can definitely do that. But I guess, is there anything else that's going on right now that you want to share with everybody before we uh, start our start our prep here? Because we're going to go train in yeah. a few minutes. I think that was pretty good. Yeah. We'll go get some food and get a workout in. So Absolutely. Covered it all. Awesome. Well, again, thanks for sharing everything. I know it's really intimate details of the situation with the birth and everything else. Cause like I said, you were blown away. So I, I appreciate you sharing that mm -hmm. with the audience because you were able to share a lot of that with me personally, yeah. but it's such a different perspective for so many people out there. And the people that have had kids, they're going to be like, wow, I could connect back to that time. Yeah. But then the people who haven't are going to listen to it and be like, wow, is it that crazy? And, and everything nope, else. They won't know until they're there. Exactly. Yep. It's just the magic of it. But now, so everybody out there that's, you know, we're going to be, doing some cool um cool workouts here in the next couple of days i know that we're gonna load you up a little bit more on food we're gonna do that too so that should make you happy hop Dottie. i don't know we're gonna try hop Dottie, and then we're gonna there was some another one that was supposed to be pretty good too seafood place or yes burger place? Uh, both yeah there was one more but we'll Rock get and roll yeah we got we got to get the we got to load you up so that we can bring you down so it's going to be a good time and then, uh, and then the next podcast we'll talk about whether or not you ever want to go into the open or not because I know that's still a yep. still a thing. You still want to do it? Three hundred and ten pound sea bum. Three oh five. Three oh five. You still you still want to do it? I'm absolutely going to get to three hundred pounds and compete in the open next year and beat Derek Lunsford. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. There you go. It right there. That's it. That's it. You heard it here, guys. <laughs> We're going to use that as a soundbite. Yep. All right, guys. Send it to him. We're going to get ready to go train. Again, thank you. Um, you don't need to follow Seabum here. Already, you already probably do. So <laughs> I normally maybe, I have to say not. follow Seabum on there. And if you don't, then you should. Again, guys, Seabum, Hani Rambod, and that's the truth. <laughs>